Thanks for tuning in to another installment of Advanced TV Herstory, a podcast that analyzes shows and celebrates women of television. Thousands of comedies, variety shows, and dramas have aired, yet the presence of strong women, both in front of and behind the camera, is often a story untold. Well, Advanced TV Herstory begs to differ. There's so much more, and it's worth telling and retelling. Sometimes shows offer great leadership lessons or are so timeless in their writing that people say the series has aged well. We'll explore those shows further. We'll revisit moments in TV where women broke records, exceeded expectations, or put their careers on the line. Advanced TV history will connect the treasures of the past to the great potential of today's TV and online platforms and how it all plays a part in being a woman in America today. Tomorrow's success is rooted in understanding what has come before us. So gear up for a little storytelling and fun, sociology, fashion, economics, or strategy. It's all here in Advanced TV Herstory. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Lucille Ball. Yes, we all love Lucy in black and white or maybe rich 60s color. Together with her husband, Desi Arnaz, a Cuban-born musician, they leveraged all their drive, creativity, business acumen, and occasionally life savings to set high standards and create processes for the budding television industry. Without Lucy and Desi and their company, Desilu Studios, TV may not have taken as many risks in the early days as it did. Lucille Ball was born in 1911 and died in 1989. When the show I Love Lucy hit its mark in the mid-50s, Lucy was north of 40. This installment of Advanced TV Herstory is a brief look into how this woman handled her fame via the rare video clips housed online. We're going to see a humble woman. It's not a biography, but there is one book that I relied on to frame the context of some of these clips, and I highly recommend it. It's Stephen Canfer's Ball of Fire, The Tumultuous Life and Comic Art of Lucille Ball, published in 2003. And Stefan Canfer is spelled S-T-E-F-A-N, Canfer, K-A-N-F-E-R. It's well written, and it's thoroughly researched, and a good, good book. As a pioneer in the television industry who rose quickly to a high profile, Lucille Ball's TV appearances reveal a little more about the game face that she honed to perfection over the years. We'll listen to clips from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s that remind us that she successfully navigated the scrutiny applied to celebrities. She came from a hard scrabble background and worked very hard to achieve success. Women of that generation tended to keep their private lives and emotions private. By the time of her death in 1989, Lucy knew she was loved. She had received pretty much every recognition and award within the television industry and American culture. Here's part of a tribute paid to her in 1986 when she was recognized at the Kennedy Center Honors in Washington, D.C. This clip is available on YouTube. The Golden Girls, the Arthur. <laughs> and my sister Sam, Pam Dauber, and Valerie, Valerie Harper. <laughs> to our antenna watch reruns of her each night to be sure that we do it right a lesson for us all is Miss Lucille Ball who's mastered every comedy trick Lucy on top of every comedy stick Lucy she plans a simple outing together with her neighbor Ethel Merton. Before you know, they're shouting, and all of us are laughing till it hurts. The screen, the television, the stage. Lucy, you've earned a place on history's page. Lucy, for what you've done for women, we think you know exactly how we feel. Lucy. 
What makes this Kennedy Center Honors tribute so important? A few things. First, it's long been a practice that the President of the United States attends the Washington, D.C.-based Night of Entertainment. So we see cutaways to Ronald and Nancy Reagan, whom Lucy had known for decades from their shared Hollywood experience. And if you read any Lucille Ball biographies, you learn about her rocky marriage to Desi and how even upon their divorce, their lives intertwined, running Desilu Studios and raising their children. In his book, Canfer gives ample coverage to the period after Lucy had become a national icon when the waning days of the House Un-American Activities Committee chewed on a fact that at one point Lucille Ball had registered in a California election as a communist. Her public statements at the time do not deny the fact, and she offered the explanation that she did so to appease her grandfather. So you have to realize that Lucille Ball's father had died when Lucy was very young, and her grandfather, whom she transplanted, along with the rest of her family from upstate New York to California, once she had established her career in Hollywood, was indeed an important figure in her life up until his death. Lucille Ball knew just how grave these allegations could become. Similar charges had been waged by conservative Washington politicians in years past, based on far less truth than what Lucy readily admitted, and those charges had ruined Hollywood careers. This dark cloud hung over her head off and on for years, but eventually passed quietly. She was an all-American star at that point, and the claim was too small and discreet for anything more to be made of it. But I'm sure that when Lucille Ball was escorted into the reception room to visit President and Mrs. Reagan, not a word was said about his role in blacklisting and feeding the anti-communist fervor that threatened the creativity and independence of the motion picture and television industry. Lucy had more on her mind. Five days before the Kennedy Center Honors event, Desi Arnaz had passed away from lung cancer. Following their divorce, they had collaborated on projects and stayed in touch. But the divorce, chronicled in Canfer's book, revealed the worst side of fame and success. Desi's bad habits had become worse. Lucy struggled to begin learning the business side of Desilu Studios as his judgment faltered. They had built a major Hollywood powerhouse together, and in the divorce it was split 50-50. And a few years afterward, she bought out his share. The Kennedy Center Honors producers had received a statement from Desi before his death, which was read at the event by actor Robert Stack. It's respectful and filled with admiration and love. Cutaways to Lucy in the public eye at such a public event show her doing all she can, seated next to husband Gary Morton, to maintain composure. So, when B. Arthur, Valerie Harper, and Pam Dauber, okay, remember, this was the mid-80s, come out singing Lucy's praises, she must have welcomed the relief and release. She was a private woman. And while there are many women in comedy who credit Lucy with inspiring them, by virtue of timing and the form that Lucy's late career took, few actually had the opportunity to work with her or even meet her. Her second and third major TV series, entitled The Lucy Show and Here's Lucy, aired from 1962 to 1974. And those shows readily featured big-name guests who thoroughly enjoyed the cameo appearance with the First Lady of Television. Uh, people like Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton, Tallulah Bankhead. But one of those few young performers to emerge from a little Lucy exposure was Carol Burnett. A legend in her own right and 22 years younger than Lucille Ball, Carol Burnett, in my view, delivered a respectful but candid recollection of her time working with Lucy. Well, she never censored herself from here to here. Whatever she said, she was thinking, and it came out. And sometimes you'd think, whew, just a little, like she'll say, what's that light up there for? What are you doing with the light? Like that, to the lighting guy. He'd say, Lucy, I'm doing this such and such. She said, okay, let me see what you... Great. Great. So she was never picking on anybody. She just was the way she was. And they would lay their lives down for her. Because when she said, that's great, she meant it. When she said, that stinks, she meant it, but it was never personal. That stinks. Let's see if we can fix that. Ooh. She really... I guess I can tell this. One time she said, uh, we went out to dinner together. Uh, she was doing my show. 
and we were on a dinner break, and so I took her across the street to the farmer's market, and we went to a little Italian restaurant. And I was working with my husband on our show. Joe was the producer, and he was the first he was the first person I worked for on the Gary Moore show. He had produced Gary's show, so that's how we met. And so Joe was producing my show, and Lucy said to me, she says, it's great that you got Joe because he can work on the stuff for you the way Desi did with me. Desi would deal with the writers. He would deal with the scripts. He would do all, and she said, and all I had to do was come in on Monday and be Lucy, crazy Lucy. I didn't have to do anything but perform. And she said, and then we got divorced. And she said, and that's when they put the S on the end of my name because she had to get tough because nobody would listen to crazy little Lucy. So she, not tough, but just truthful. And it was unheard of for the women to do that. Now, Gleason could say anything. Probably Sid could, Caesar. But if a woman did, she was a bitch. If a guy did, he was he knew what he wanted. You know, it's thank goodness that's changed. But I was always afraid to speak up on my show. It was if I didn't like something, I would say, you know, maybe it's me, but I'm just not very good in the sketch. <laughs> it was it was my way of getting around, you know, I didn't wanna get anybody mad at me. Well, now I'm able to realize that no can be a complete sentence and not have to explain myself too much, as long as you say it nicely. When Carol said Lucy said they put an S on her name, that was her way of saying that the crew had given her the nickname Lucille Balls, now that Desi was out of the picture. It's pretty cool to think of the overlap of these shows on prime time, since The Carol Burnett Show premiered in 1967 and pressed on for more than a decade, and that Carol had Lucy on as a guest. Carol's read of Lucy's frankness can readily be found in Lucy's guest appearance on The Dick Cavett Show. And again, this is a clip that's available on YouTube, and if you happen to find it, you will see that Lucy is wearing this big, obnoxious brown coat. You have to think mid-70s here. And it has trim that looks like poodle fur on the neck and the cuffs and down the front. So based on how cranky she sounds... 1974, she's only 63 years old. You get the feeling she's waiting for someone to ask her better questions, be more profound, and if not, she'll do the probing. I wash those myself. I believe it. You're short-handed around here. <laughs> short-handed. Oh, I see. I don't think making fun of people's physical characteristics is a good kind of humor. If you had spat that water out, then I would, I, have, I would have been surprised. I adore you. You do? Besides, you're a little Dutch boy. Why do you call me a Dutch boy? You look like it. A what Dutch, are you? A Dutch boy? Yeah, what are you? Well, I'm uh, mostly uh, white and black and yellow and red. My God, I'm... you won't talk about anything about yourself, will you? Who said? <laughs> I said. Yes, you I'll tell you. You answer that. What are you? <laughs> What nationality are Say, you? why are you turning the tables No, here? but why? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't not put What that nationality out. am I? Yeah, I just wonder if you're English or My Scotch grandfather or uh, came from, uh, one of them came from England, uh, the other one came from um, Wales. No, that's not too tough to answer, is it? My <laughs> you've become Don Rickles there tonight. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm Scottish, Irish, English, and uh, possibly uh, partly French and, and uh, a dose of German. Watch it. Uh, that's what we are, without the dose. Without the <laughs> French, English. No <laughs> dose, eh? French, English, Scotch, Irish. Yankee, that's what. That's why I ask you. I yeah. thought so. You're New England. Well, yeah, we pioneered through Ohio into New York State. Covered wagon <laughs> stuff. I didn't. Well, Don't look oh, at no. me like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My great grandparents. No were hardy pioneer stock. Yes, they were. Yeah. As much as no one would have considered Dick Cavett or his writers fools, you get the impression from Lucy's tone that she, as the saying goes, didn't suffer fools gladly. The professionalism of which Burnett speaks is a theme throughout later Lucy biographies. You also learn from those books that she was deliberate, strategic, and serious about her craft, acting, and the business side of the industry, Desilu Studios. 
It's just that when given the opportunity to dig more deeply into those areas, either the interviewer was told not to go there or didn't think the audience would be interested in that depth. I, I don't know, but it's, um, it's a little disappointing. My point is that even Barbara Walters, in a big, fancy Barbara Walters 1977 interview, couldn't extract more from Lucy than the sort of canned, cursory reflection one might call guarded. Inadvertently, sort of twirling the dial. Well, I feel it was a funny looking hairdo and a funny looking <laughs> skirt, and, I, and I, I looked like I was forever pregnant because I was either having one or just getting rid of one. But uh, I know that they were well written, and we had a wonderful time doing them, and I think it shows. That is the essence of our comedy, those early I Love Lucy. And uh, gave me my education in mm. the whole thing. Did you have trouble selling those first I Love Lucy? No, we didn't have trouble selling them because we were... I mean, the concept. I'd heard that when you first came to CBS with the Cuban band leader and... Well, the, they, you know, they, they said, didn't what? want to buy Desi as my husband. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, why not? He is. And they said, well, Cuban, and we want an American. So we got together and went out uh, in Baudible for a few weeks to, to see how they accepted mm -hmm. us. And they did. And when I came back, I insisted. That's all. I said... I, I expected to only do the show for a year, and, and uh, no one who knew it was going to go on this long or get that big or the, 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 the business would snowball. My, my success was never labeled success by anyone uh, close to me. It was just go to work and do a good job, get the show out, learn how to do it, and do it to the best that it, uh, you know, the best that it can be done, and teach others how to do it, because it was, as I say, a, a new way of doing things. I didn't have time to think of of uh, being a success personally. If the show was doing well, that was good. It's been said that you're very tough to work for. Are you? Are you a perfectionist? A uh, perfectionist, I, I decided is attention to detail, which I'm very proud of, and that's the way I learned my craft. That's one thing that I, second thing I think that I'm proudest of, that I've learned my craft. It's just sort of a game face. If she only told people as much as was necessary, and she never got too personal. And it's that which Canfer alludes to in his extensive bibliography of his book, Ball of Fire. I appreciate Canfer's listing and providing a, a brief comment about the books, the major books that were written about the famous couple, Lucy and Desi. Both Lucy and Desi wrote bi autobiographies, and there are nine biographies written throughout the decades. So about Lucille Ball's autobiography, published in 1996, seven years after her death, Canfer observed, quote, a posthumously published, less than frank exercise in nostalgia. The tone is clearly that of a woman who would rather not bear any grudges in print and who is withholding a lot from the reader. Nonetheless, a valuable item because Lucy wrote so little about herself, end quote. So fortunately for us, YouTube offers up video, apart from all the TV series, that help us see a little more inside Lucy than she was willing to write. She was, however, incredibly consistent in giving credit to her show's writers, producers, directors, and Desi over the years. In answering Barbara Walters' questions, you may note that she immediately credited the writers for their brilliance and their groundbreaking approach to TV comedy. One was a woman, Madeline Pugh Davis, who, along with Bob Carroll Jr., wrote episodes for all of Lucy's series and others that were produced out of Desilu Studios. Late in her life, Madeline Pugh Davis wrote her own autobiography, Laughing with Lucy, My Life with America's Leading Lady of Comedy. Now, I haven't read it yet, but I bet Treva Silverman, the first woman writer of the Mary Tyler Moore Show and who has been profiled in an installment of Advance TV Herstory, did The Minute It Hit the Bookstores. Madeline Pugh Davis's book, Laughing with Lucy, was published in 2005, and Davis herself passed away in 2011. There is also a great interview of her online at metvlegends.org. Okay, so why is it important that we know about Madeline Pugh Davis? Well, first of all, Lucille Ball gives Madeline and this core team of writers so much credit for her success. Lucy maintained her brain didn't think funny, but she could do funny, if it was given to her. Living a career in the spotlight and as celebrated as Lucy was, that's the definition of humility. 
In fact, it goes clear back to 1953 when I Love Lucy won its first Emmy as Best Sitcom. The show had premiered only two years earlier. ...to the podium and Mr. Preston Foster, who has just been introduced. And the nominees for the Best Situation Comedy are Burns and Allen, I Love Lucy, Mr. Peepers, Our Miss Brooks, and Topper. It even has a big seal on it, so nobody can look in. It is my pleasure to present the Television Academy's 1953 National Award for the best situation comedy to I Love Lucy. up here and give it to them, would it? <laughs> but I wish we could. Thanks very, very much. We're awful proud to be a part of this industry. Really, we are. We're trying real hard, and we're going to keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. You carry it, buddy. I'll carry it. Well, you know, I just want to say this, and I really mean this. I hope that next year, the Academy does not forget the writers. And if we may this year, we'd like to give it right now to Oppenheimer, Carol, Pugh, and Frawley. <laughs> Lo and behold, in 1954, the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences debuted the award for outstanding writing for a comedy series. That, ladies and gentlemen, is power exercised for good. Did you hear how earnest Lucy was in her remarks? Some of her most revealing moments came when she had no time or expectation to prepare. And in 1967, she emerged from her seat, stunned and unprepared once again, to accept one of her four career Emmys. The nominees are Elizabeth Montgomery, Bewitched. I know what a wonderful feeling it is to be part of the magical life, to have so much at your fingertips. Lucille Ball, The Lucy Show. Agnes Moorhead, yes, bewitched. It is. Ah, he doesn't know. Oh, how delicious. You will like him, I'll tell you what. Marlo you Thomas, no, I'm not that girl. Really I'm just going to let you stay up all night trying to get. In Hollywood, the winner is Lucille Ball. <laughs> Love Lucy Show won the Emmy Award for Best Situation Comedy. And in 1952, Miss Ball won the award as Best Comedian. <laughs> I can't believe it. I honestly cannot believe it. I don't have one thing prepared to say because I just didn't expect it. It's been a long, long time. I have one or two and they they mean a lot because it's given by you all part of the industry I just sort of seemed a way and a part of what we're really doing. It left 
a long time ago, and I'm glad it's back. Uh, last time I got it, I thought they gave it to me because I had a baby. <laughs> and that baby is 14 years old now. I love my work. Thank you for giving me this for it. This was the real Lucille Ball. Classy, humble, delivering a heartfelt thank you to her peers. Mmm. But Lucy was as decorated a TV hero and veteran of rubber chicken dinners as anyone. In this clip from a 1969 Johnny Carson Tonight Show appearance, you get the sense that Lucy knew a good awards show when she saw one, or had to sit through one. I was going to say, when you walked out, I was going to say congratulations because you were voted the first lady of television by the International Academy of Television Arts and Science. Thank you. Uh, I, would, I would have been there, but Andy Devine has asked me to a wiener roast, and I was, uh, I was, it was I a, had a previous night. commitment. It was a great night. Some of them can uh, kind of frighten you, but this was a real yeah. warm, wonderful testimonial. Event. Usually they're zingers. They kind of... Yeah, this, this was a rib roast. Right. Yeah. Just one thing that happened, they they put me up on a shelf or at a table where there, it was up on a, you know, what do you call it, a landing, a, a Dave, shelf. Dinosaur. No, not a dais, but a, a uh, step. An airplane. <laughs> a book? I don't know. I was up higher. An umbrella? Or anyway. Ashtray? And they put a, a spotlight on our table. It went on for four and a half hours. Well, Johnny, I, it was wonderful. Marvelous people. Milton Berle, MC. Dinah Shore, Michelle Lee. Uh, Rowan and Mark. Did I forget anyone? Carol Burnett. And Carol yeah. Burnett. What a lineup. Wonderful, wonderful friends of mine. And they were all great, but they never took the spotlight off me. And they segued from one to the other. And they sang their songs at the table. And they told their jokes directly at me. And four and a half hours without going to the ladies' room. <laughs> and I was dying. And I'm, I'm only human now, after <laughs> all. And I, I couldn't find a spot where I could get up and leave because the spotlight never left. So finally, Milton was segueing into someone else, and I just raised my hand like a school kid, and I said, Milton, ad-lib for a while. And that was, of course, my first big mistake. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, the spotlight followed me all the way to the lady. Have you ever had a spotlight follow you to the ladies' room? <laughs> oh, you never go there. Or do you? <laughs> anyway, Milton told about 50... The ad libbed about 50 jokes concerning my destination. Mm-hmm. And if it hadn't been in my honor, I don't think I ever would have come back. <laughs> but I had to. It was That's a great, great night. Fun. It really was. Whose idea was it to have continuous spotlight? Telling the story on national TV may have been Lucy's way of providing feedback to the event planners at the Academy. Like Carol Burnett tells us, Lucy's commitment to quality was her hallmark. Everything was truthful. Even as as silly as it was, it was serious. It was serious business with her. And she was uh, so meticulous about her props and about business, funny business of how to work this out. She would really have it all down. I don't know that there was that much improvisation, but she sure had a, it was a well-oiled machine, her show. Uh, the Lucy show that I did. Uh, we'd go in and tape it, or film it, actually, three three cameras. And um, we'd be out of there in an hour. Now, today, I know these sitcoms go for ages. You know, they'll start taping at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and 3 o'clock the next morning, they're still at it, which I think is ridiculous. Lucille Ball lived an incredible life and had a tremendous sense of humor. It's great to think that she got to laugh as much as she did, because who doesn't appreciate more laughter in their life? She surrounded herself by hardworking people who, too, were hugely successful at making others laugh. It's just that there are so few people left to tell those stories. Call us fortunate and turn the channel back to YouTube, where you can find a 1975 episode of Dinah's Place. Actually, it's an excerpt from um, a different TV show that I haven't been able to identify. But it was once shown on Dinah's Place, which was a talk show hosted by Dinah Shore. Lucy and her longtime co-star Vivian Vance were reunited for what would turn out to be one of their last public appearances together 
In her later years, Vance suffered strokes and passed away in 1979. But in 1975, she had the stories to tell, and Dinah's place was the haven for women storytellers. Dinah Shore, celebrated singer from the 40s and 50s, ran her talk shows through the 70s. Fashion, now think bright red slacks, they were slacks back then, not pants, and a white blouse with a white v-neck tennis vest that might have had a red v on it, that was Dinah's place. Lively banter among the women. Dinah was always so nice and bubbly. Anyway, so Vivian brought her A-game with these two stories. Lucy didn't say much throughout Viv's bits, as you'll hear, but she nodded occasionally, added some color commentary, and laughed. This is a rare appearance when Lucy was in her natural hair color phase, a scary blend of white-gray in the front and otherwise black-gray toward the back. It's important you know that because Vivian mentions it, as well as Lucy's trademark henna treatments. And I also wanted to tell you that you let your roots grow out. <laughs> I finally did. I finally did. I the reunion was the first time the two had seen each other in years following Vivian's move to the San Francisco Bay Area. You thought I was in an old lady's home, didn't you? I didn't know where you were. I knew you were out here once and I was away. And then I didn't know what happened to you. I didn't hear. We were on the phone a lot, but we hadn't seen each other. Where have you been? Oh, I've been doing all kinds of selling coffee mostly. Well, yeah. that I see. <laughs> Vivian, who had done a popular series of coffee commercials at the time, couldn't mask the emotion of the moment. Look, you always have to watch us cry a little when we see each other. Oh, isn't that We've been lovely. through a lot together, two husbands, two divorces. <laughs> she surprised her friend by bringing along an old gag gift Lucy had given her years earlier, a mock contract from her days on the show. Now, this is material that Lucille wrote. And I'm going to read it. I love it. I love is it. Is this your employment contract? Yes. This is my employment contract. I gave contract. her a new contract. After a certain, a certain uh, number of years, mm -hmm. Lucille wrote me this contract. Party of the first part must promise to never dye her hair within five shades either way. <laughs> of the party of the second part, also known as the lovable natural redhead. Yes, of course. Part two. Party of the first part must also agree to put on an additional five pounds every month for the next year. <laughs> Otherwise, this contract shall be terminated at the whim of the party of the second part <laughs> by one, a phone call, or the most, or the more generous option of 30 minutes notice, Lucille Ball. <laughs> It's hard to tell who else was sitting on Dinah's couch that day. It looks like it might be Lucy Arnez, daughter of, De of Lucy and Desi, maybe seated to Dinah's left, but Vivian came loaded for laughs. Ever so often she'd get me over there on a Saturday, and she'd put the bleach on my hair and she'd put the henna on her hair, and then we'd sit around and gab and... And, uh, oh, we have, we'd have old slacks on and a couple old shirts. And, and so Hours. we were sitting in her beautiful home in Beverly Hills, and she had an operation on, her, on your toes, that's right, and um, grown toenails. So her feet were up on, a, on the coffee table, and she had great hunks of cotton in and between. And sticks. And then they were all wrapped old up feet. like this. And I had some old dirty shorts on, I guess. But anyway, there that's we it. were. Real oh. operation. And there was a great sound of sirens and... and uh, Officers and motorcycles. Oh, and bleach there. on your hair, and she's got henna, and, and she's, she's got, got the henna, and I've got the bleach. And she's got two like cotton toes. She's got her okay. toes all wrapped up. Okay. And she said something's happened at Jack Benny's, Vivian. I can't run. I can't walk. Run to the door, see what's happening at Jack Benny's, because he lives such next to Such sirens, door. such oh. motorcycle cops. You so know. I ran to the door, like my boss told me. I <laughs> <laughs> said, Lucille. It's here. It's here. They're all coming up the walk. They're all coming up the walk. And it looks so, it looks so, and she said, well, come sit down. They'll never recognize them. <laughs> so the two of us sat there, me with the white bleach on and her with the red bleach on and these awful clothes. And this whole entourage walked into the house. Into and the across, house? And yeah. somebody bowed low as they went by, and we just, oh, it sounds like a show, doesn't it, Diana? Yeah, it does. It doesn't sound real at all. No, it doesn't. So nobody paid any attention to us at all, so we just thought we'd sit there and watch it all go on. They went upstairs, they went out to the guest house, it's all these people, and this man was dressed 
kind of like the king and I. Uh -huh. That was kind of odd, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but we weren't going to say anything. And finally they came through and... The women weren't bad. No, they were all dressed up in those... With I said, the thing in the middle of the forehead. Oh, really? So I said... The man said, thank you very much. And we said, who was that? You know, because we'd really like to know who this entourage was that went by as the two of us were sitting there and said, that was the king of Siam. <laughs> Lucy, Viv, Jack, Benny, they were all just hanging out, all just a bit surprised that they made it in their chosen profession. In early days of TV, you brought your best act and you prayed for a break. In this clip from that same Johnny Carson Tonight Show, where she complained about the awards show, Lucy revealed that she too could be awed by another's genius, by the presence of a star. Hello. I, <laughs> you look groovy, as they say. Thank you. Really do. Thank you. Anniversary. You got an anniversary coming up? Wednesday, is it not? I think Gary told me. Yes. Our your, eighth. Your eighth wedding anniversary? Yes. May I see that? Don't touch. <laughs> May I partake of a second help? <laughs> W.C. Fields on that thing with my little shake. Oh, that's beautiful. That is Speaking gorgeous. of W.C. Fields, I saw Mae West the other night. Did you really? It was the first time I had ever been in her company. I want to tell you, I was never so thrilled in my life. She is fantastic. That's what they say. She is fantastic. You can't believe it until you're sitting this close to her. The way she talks, the way she thinks, the way she looks. They say it's something. She wrote a letter one night on the show and sent it to me. Really? Oh, you yeah. got a fan letter from Mae West? It was a very nice letter. We were talking about it. She sent me a letter, and I still got it. I was thrilled. May I touch you? Yes, because I don't save many letters, but... She's not doing television because, as you know, I think she, uh, first of all, is doing Myra Breckenridge. She's too smart to do television. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she just sits up there and takes it easy. You're not getting tired of doing television, are you? Didn't you no. get to the point once where you were going to quit and says, uh, No, I never got to a point where I was going to quit. I've been on 18 years. Okay, that bit is cool and fun. So imagine my delight when, digging a little deeper on the interwebs, I found this exchange between Oprah Winfrey and Bette Midler. So come to think of it, there's something strangely therapeutic about the TV talk show couch. Dinah, Johnny, Oprah, they all get people to say things. Of course. I love Lucy, and I loved her. I loved her. I loved her with all my heart. I thought she was a genius. And, you know, there's, you know, I met I know, her daughter. Now we know how much of a genius she really she was. She was a genius. Yes, she yeah. was a genius. But I'll tell you, she was surrounded by geniuses, too. And a lot of them were women. And, in fact, I met her. She came to see me when I was just for sort of starting out in, in uh, not, uh, not arenas, but, in, like, theaters. Met Lucy? I met Lucy. She came to the, she came to the trade with her. And she invited me to her home. And the next day. What was she like? Well, she had, by that time, she was talking like this. She was really, really tall. She was really tall. She was the tallest person I ever met. And she, she took up a lot of space. Yeah. And I'm a small person. I'm short. So I was like, wow, it's Lucy. Did she realize she was <laughs> Lucy? Did I or did, did she? Do you think I don't, she, 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 did, she owned do I, it? I, yes, I do. Really? I, but she, because she, never, she was always a, a sort of a small town person, always. Uh -huh. Even though she was Lucy, uh -huh. even though she was a mogul, she, her heart was really in a small town place. When I met, went to see her home, she talked extensively about her own mother, mm. who had recently passed. Mm -hmm. She had a, uh, she talked about her handyman. She showed me her handyman's work. Wow. Okay. Um, and she, she had a Scrabble board built, it, cemented into the living room floor. I mean, she had a, that's my memory of it, that she had a Scrabble board and she had a dictionary next to it that, and that this was a big Webster's dictionary that was open and she was a, a, a she invited me to play Scrabble with her and I, nice. she beat me. I was going to say who won? She won. Like, as soon as she put the first, she put the first, the first thing she put down was seven letters. So, oh, wow. of course, it was like, ooh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so bad. I feel like an idiot when I only play four letters. Well, so do I. <laughs> Are you trying to uh, try, trying to bait me no, to play I'm Scrabble not, with you? No, I am not, not playing Scrabble with you. I am not playing Scrabble with you. So, yeah, the much-celebrated, successful, divine Ms. M had her moment of awe as well. Storytelling is a skill that we as women are losing all too quickly. Our weekends aren't filled with highlight reels of great things other women did all week, and the number of talk shows, well... I think we're down to counting on one hand only, the talk shows that remain today. And late night sort of counts, but sort of doesn't. 
because I know I'll feel better once we have a late night talk show hosted by a woman. So we can feel good that more information has been shared about Lucille Ball than she was ever willing to reveal in her own autobiography or to Barbara Walters, but there are still some questions that only Lucy could have answered as a woman and as an early, early agent leader in the industry. Here's what I would have asked Lucy. So, shortly after your divorce from Desi, you bought out his share of Desilu Studios. As CEO, reviewing potential TV shows in development, you were presented with Star Trek. What was it about Star Trek that caused you to pull it out of the wastebasket and give it the green light? And how did William Shatner thank you? <laughs> okay, or to set up this question, I would quote Canfer's book on page 126 about some early decisions to film I Love Lucy before a studio audience, um, and that is something that had never really been done before, and how to get it distributed nationwide. So Canfer wrote, quote, In 1951, when only 8 million Americans owned TV sets, shows were carried city to city via coaxial cable. It failed to reach even halfway across the country. Some 85% of viewers were located in the East and Midwest. Instead of seeing I Love Lucy live, they would be forced to see a kinescope made earlier, a blurred and indeed cheesy version of the show. So I would have asked, Lucy, you and Desi were assuming daunting risk to shoot the episodes before a live audience, it had never been done before, and to put it on 35mm film, and by the way, this is why it was so well preserved for reruns, what were those conversations like? Was there ever a moment when either one of you wanted to back out? Or I have about a hundred other questions that I would have loved to ask Lucy. But you got to know that the quality of the film product, the fact that it was preserved on 35 millimeter, was what made I Love Lucy the first and most venerable sitcom in reruns. And it's because those reruns aired from the 60s well into today. Turn on, turn on a channel and you'll find one. They are responsible for building Lucille Ball's legacy as much as anything else that went on. She was happily giving credit, the behind-the-scenes credit, to Desi. So we have to look to the TV shows themselves and her talent and all of her uh, physical comedy that separates her from everyone else who's ever been on TV. Quality through and through, from the writing to the production process, Lucille Ball was a fairly humble, detail-oriented professional. What's not to love? As we roll the credits on this installment of Advanced TV Herstory, I'll recommend Stefan Kantfer's book, Ball of Fire, from 2003, as a real good read about Lucy. If you're more interested in Desilu Studios' pioneering role in the TV industry, I'd suggest Coyne Stephen Sanders and Tom Gilbert's book, Desilu, The Story of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, from 1993. Shoot me a line with ideas for future installments or moments in TV history that inspire or frustrate you. Our Twitter handle is TV History, and our email is advanced tv history at gmail.com i'd be mighty grateful if you'd recommend this podcast to your friends your endorsement means a lot to me and if you don't already you can subscribe to the show at either the main hosting site libsyn.com l-i-b-s-y-n.com or itunes i'm happy to help you navigate that if you think you'd like to but aren't quite sure how Finally, find this and scripts of past installments at my website, CynthiaBemisAbrams.com. If you'd like to have me speak to your group about any of these topics, or podcasting, or Dinosaur's Closet, you'll find more contact information there as well. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams.